100%. Not lukewarm, not cold, hot, 100%. All of your faith in this right here, the body and blood of the Lord. All of it. All of it. You want to experience all of the kingdom? Then put all of your trust in the kingdom. Hold nothing back. Surrender everything to him. He's good. He's worthy. We run to him today. His arms are open. He's smiling at us. He's our father. My son, my daughter, thank you for running to me. Thank you for coming to me in your time of need. Thank you for coming to me in your time of blessing. When you have no need and you're blessed and you're full and abundant, thank you for not being filled with pride because of your blessing. But humbling yourself no matter what and the good and bad and coming to me and confessing Jesus and his blood and his body, his crucifixion, his resurrection. I'm telling you guys, you can put all of your trust in this and you will not be let down. You will not be let down. A couple things before we take communion together as a family. If you have unconfessed sin in your relationship with Jesus that you know of and he knows of, confess it to him now. Give him your sin. Say, Lord, examine my heart. Examine me. Trust me. You want to be examined by the Lord because he's loving when he does it. Let the Lord examine you right now for a moment. Lord, show me any sin. Show me anything in my life that has grieved you and then confess it and repent of it. Examine my Kids too. Kids too. If you know the Lord, if you have a relationship with the Lord. Parents, you know if your children have a relationship with the Lord, help them, coach them in repentance and examining themselves. It's an opportunity to be forgiven by the Lord. And if any of you kids don't know if you're in a relationship with Jesus, ask your parents to show you and lead you in a prayer of confessing Jesus as your Lord and as your best friend. Father, we confess as a church, if there's anything in our congregation that you don't want, that you want to change, God, we give it to you. We ask for your mercy and your grace. May this place, may Zion be a habitation for your presence. May you delight in this place. May you delight in what we do as a family together. We receive your grace today. Just one more short, short moment. Now thank Him. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy that's more faithful than the sun this morning. Say, Lord, have your way. In communion this morning, minister to my soul. And now a second thing. He not only deals with your sin by crushing it, flooding it with his blood. The resurrection of his body releases to you healing in your body. And by the stripes on his back, you're healed. If you have sickness in your body, receive healing today. Say, Lord, do it by faith. Say, Lord, as I receive your body today in communion, I believe by faith that I too am healed. And I receive your touch on my body this morning. Thank you. Partake of the blood and body. Go ahead.
for a moment. Our stillness and our waiting is just as powerful as singing. exchange today. Matter of fact, I know there was an exchange today. I just, I feel the tangible privilege of being able to worship with you saints today. It's amazing. I feel the privilege of getting to sing to our God together. And I feel the exchange. We ministered to the Lord and He ministered to us. Deep cries out to deep in the roar of his waterfall. His waterfall is his Holy Spirit. As you pour out your heart before him, his spirit ministers to you and transforms your life and makes you into the likeness of his son, Jesus. That's the goal. That's why we're showing up, to be like Jesus. He's my idol. He is. He's my hero. He's more famous to me than anybody on the earth, anybody on TV. There's no one else I'd rather meet than him. And it's amazing. You don't have to go anywhere to meet him. You just go in your prayer closet and meet with the King of Kings or here on Sundays and you meet with him. Ken, I just feel like you're supposed to come close our worship with the goodness of God, however you want to release it, man. Come and declare and minister to us. Daddy, we come this morning as your children. Dad, show us, show, show us what it means to be your children, children of the King. Father, you're so good. There's nothing in you that's bad. Father, we ask for revelation of your goodness in every aspect of our life any area that we don't see it father we ask for revelation right now in jesus name for your goodness over our lives father we thank you we thank you for increase supernatural increase we thank you for peace supernatural peace even when we can't see an avenue of peace father you are good we praise you this morning we pray, over our, we pray over our country, Father. We just release your peace and your goodness and your favor over our country and everyone that's in it, all of our brothers and sisters. Father, let your church rise up today. From this day forward, let your church rise up and unite with one thing in mind, to bring your peace and your love to this nation, Father. Father, give us power. Give your church power right now in Jesus' name. Let us receive your power. 
through Jesus Christ that dwells in each one of us, Father. Let us see how we can unite and use your power in us to overcome this world, Father, in all things. We thank you for these men and women here, Father. We pray supernatural health over each one of these men and women, that no sickness can flee out of this room. It must get out. It cannot depart this room. We thank you, Father. We thank you for increase, supernatural increase that can be used to build your kingdom here. Father, thank you for a revelation of heaven. Thank you, Jesus. We bless this word by Pastor Zach this morning. Let us have increase in knowledge. Father, thank you. Thank you for being sons of God in this church family. Go out, push back darkness, bring the light in every place you go. Thank you, Father, for your love and your goodness. In Jesus' name. Come on up, Brittany. Come on up. We're going to agree with the Father as he does business with you. His plans towards you are good. His thoughts towards you are perfect. He has plans to give you a hope and a future and not to harm you. None of his plans include harm. His plans towards you are only good all the time. All the time. All the time. It's just happening naturally. The Holy Spirit is leading you guys to speak over this daughter. Release the authority of heaven over her. We say be completely healed in the name of the Lord. All sickness go. I break the spirit of infirmity of your life by the blood of Jesus. I command you to be broken. Leave now. You are a daughter of the King, and your life will be preserved. Be strengthened today in the name of Jesus. Be strengthened in the name of Jesus. I prophesy over you, you are well. You are healed. You are refreshed in the name of the Lord. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Jesus, Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus in this house. Jesus is Lord in this house. Jesus is Lord over our families. Jesus, Jesus. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in Him. Holy Spirit, burn through her body. Now, burn through her body. Everything that's not right, be made right in Jesus' name. Thank you for our birthright. Thank you for our inheritance to walk in wholeness. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, spirit, soul, and body be sanctified and healed. Jesus, we worship you. We worship you. Just worship him. Guys, just worship the king. Just worship Jesus. Just worship Jesus. Jesus cares about this one person. Just worship him. Worship Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords.
I speak over you, Brittany, will of God be done. May the name of the Lord be a banner over you seven days a week, protecting you, delivering you, shepherding you. Your husband, David, man of God, your daughters, we bless your family today. We bless you today. Revelation, John kept having visions of heaven, and every time he had a vision of heaven, heaven was declaring the same thing over and over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I pray that the holiness of God would so enrapture and captivate our church that our language would actually be limited sometimes to that one word, holy, holy. Church, let's say it together. Holy. holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Say it again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Three, three times. One more. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to share as we were worshiping, he was definitely here. The power was here. And as we started singing hallelujah, I heard him say, keep singing church. Your worship is silencing the enemy. And I could just feel him just hugging us all. So be encouraged. It was amazing. Brittany, you can be wherever you want. If you want to stay up here on the ground, let the Lord minister to you however you want. Take it away. Sometimes I just can't leave. It's so hard. I just feel myself lingering in the presence of God, just wanting to stay in there. Just another minute, Lord. Just another moment. Like, please, I don't want to go back to normalcy. I just want to stay with you forever in this moment. And I feel like that right now, just a keeping, that the Lord is keeping us in this place of his presence because we know in his presence is, is the fullness of joy. Right at his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. No one can satisfy us like the Lord. No one can fill our hearts the way the Lord does. He's our God. He's our Lord. He's our Father. He's our friend. He's our husband. He's our maker. He's our Prince of Peace. He's our shepherd. He's everything. <laughs> he is everything. Oh, thank you, Daddy. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord. Mm. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in Brittany's life, Lord. Thank you for the breakthrough and the miracles that are coming out of her life. We thank you in advance, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we come in agreement right now, Lord, for her breakthrough. In Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat>
Kids, do you want to come up here? I want to pray for you guys. I want to bless you guys. All the kids, come up. I want to lay hands on you guys. Warriors. Yes. Giant killers. <laughs> come on. Special forces. Brooklyn, Quinny, come on down. Hey, sweetheart. Come on down, honey. You kids are awesome. I love you. I love you guys. It's so amazing how we were singing that last song. Did you guys notice that last song where it talks about may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your children and your children's children and your children's children? That's for you guys. One day you're going to have children and then you're going to have grandchildren. And so we just come together as a church to bless you guys and to release the favor of God over you guys to anoint you right now, to declare over you guys that he is yours. You belong to the Lord Jesus. 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 We bless you, Liam. We bless you, Harley. We bless you, little man. We bless you. You belong to the Lord Jesus. You belong to the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for these precious souls, Lord. We bind them to your will right now, Lord. We declare over them, Lord, mighty things what they accomplish, Lord God, with the Holy Spirit and power inside of them. We declare the boldness of the Lord, the courage of the Lord, the bravery of the Lord to come across all of them, Lord God, to fill them up. I pray, Father, that at this young age, Lord, that they will learn what it means to seek your face, Amen. to seek after you, Lord God, to hunger and thirst after righteousness that, Lord God, that they would be so bored and tired of the things of this world, Lord God, and they would come running to the arms of the Father. I pray that for each and every one of these children, Lord God, that they would know who their Father is. They would know their identity in Christ is. They would know, Lord God, who you're calling them to be as sons and daughters of the living God, that they would be not confused that they would not be afraid, that they would not be filled with despair, God, but instead, Lord God, they would be filled with all of you, the fullness of God, overflowing, Lord God, every single day of their lives, Lord. And I bless them. I pray for divine health for each and every one of them, Lord, that they would continue to grow stronger, continue to grow healthier, to continue to grow in you, Lord. I pray this. And I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Amen. Hang tight for just a minute, guys, before we get dismissed. I just have a few announcements to make, okay? <clears throat> Look at somebody real quick and tell them God is so good. 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 Oh, my goodness. God is so good. Don't go out to the, the, gra the garage just yet, guys. Oh, so amazing. <laughs> There's nothing like the presence of God. Yeah, right? All right, so um, this particular week, you guys, ladies, this particular week, just this week, we have to change women's Bible study prayer time to Tuesday, Tuesday evening instead of Thursday. So if you were looking forward to coming this week, maybe you couldn't make it last week and you'd love to come, we're going to change it just to Tuesday this next week at 7 p.m. Normally we'll have it on Thursdays, and we'll go back to doing Thursdays the, the following week, okay? So please remember, ladies, we had an amazing time. It was so good. <laughs> it was so good going through the book of Matthew, and we're going to continue to go through the book of Matthew. So. For those of you who are going to come, please read cha uh, Matthew chapter 2. Just ask the Holy Spirit in your secret time with him, you know, what he wants to speak to you through the second chapter in Matthew, and then bring that to share, and we'll all uh, partake together and share, okay? So thank you, ladies. And then um, also, um, a after we get dismissed, there's a time where, you know, Zach um, dismisses you guys to go to the bathroom or get you know, coffee, you say hi to people and things like that. If you happen to go out to the front door, could you guys just remember to lock it um, on your way back in if you go out the front door? Because we don't want any kids going out of the house, getting lost or anything like that. We just want to protect our kids and keep an eye on them. And it's just helpful if that front door is locked. 
All right. Thank you, guys. And then, Savannah, you have an announcement to make. So in an effort for us to try to have a little bit more controlled environment um, in children's ministry, we put up, if you guys saw the A-frame sign there today, we're kind of trying to create a little separation. So if we could just ask for all the parents' help to try to not congregate into the kitchen and living area, um, and then we can have a more efficient, make sure each kid is signed out. And then once you have your child, um, they're your responsibility. <laughs> we're just trying to make it easier so that the teachers aren't like, feeling frazzled or feeling like we're, we're losing a kid. So if you could help us with that, kind of just try to congregate more towards the front until we get all the kids checked out to each parent. And then um, we should uh, all stay more safe that way. Yeah, that's Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, guys. And then if you brought your anonymous survey, can you please put it in the back table um, over by the coffee? All right. Well, bless you guys. Have a great time in the Word. Yay. <laughs> As the kids are heading out, Dominic, you want to come up and share something? Go ahead. Oh, yes, Lena wanted to share a tithe testimony when you do tithe Okay. Okay. You want to do that first? Or? Nope. No, I just want to thank every one of you people in that. I've never had a greater birthday than I had this last week and that and everything. And just when I thought it was the best it could be, I'm sitting it at home and Nick sends me a a text and that says are you going to be home at three o'clock and I said yeah I'll be at home at three then he sends me another text and that about 3 30 and says things are running late in that because he, he said I got a guy I wanted you to, to meet so then he said um, you'll be home at six o'clock I said yeah I'll be home at six <laughs> so six o'clock came and went and then he called and said will you be home at 7 45 I said yes Nick I'll be home at 7.45. So at 7.50, the doorbell rings, and I go to the door, and there's this big, tall drink of water guy and this other little old guy standing there and that, and I you know, think, well, what are they selling? <laughs> but he had a UPS uniform on, and he said, we're here to replace your broken windshield. And I said, well, I didn't order one. He said, we know you didn't and that, but your church has. So I praise you all and thank you. And then if that wasn't good enough, Wednesday night, we come in here and a bunch of us guys had different prayers over. And I don't know why, but I started losing some of my sight in my right eye. It's been like blurry, you know? So we prayed over it. 80% of it, you know, has gone and that it's good. And that and it's getting better. God doesn't do half time work, so he will finish it. So I, I just want to praise you and I say, I love you guys so much. I can never tell you how much I appreciate you. So 80% 80, 80 of your vi the blurriness is gone. 80% better. Yeah, 80, 85% better. Awesome. Awesome. And then some of the ladies prayed over it again this morning, so I know I'm here. Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It's been, it's definitely been a week of emotion. It's been a really great week. But I just wanted to encourage the church. We have... Sorry. All right. Oh, yeah. There's All right. your beautiful face. Okay. <laughs> hey, I can't miss it. <laughs> oh, um, you guys probably know this last year, for those of you that we've shared with, has been really trying. It's been, you know, we moved here last year, um, and it's been a season of really trusting, like every ounce of faith, right, that we've had. And so... Um, we are in escrow in California, and we're also in escrow here um, in Idaho. So we've been you know, selling our home and now buying a home. But the reason why this ties so heavily into tithing is because um, God continued, even in our, in our little, he continued to impress upon our hearts, give. It's like, Lord, you know, that's, that's really stretching me, Lord, because you know what we have, and, and it's, it would require a lot of faith. And in every single week, as the last few months have been really intense, and the last few weeks have been even more intense with emotional roller coaster of news that we were receiving from, okay, is it good? And then, oh, I don't know. And then the testimony we shared last week, and then almost feeling like, was that robbed from us? And then 
God just still continue to say, stay focused, stay focused. I'm still working. I'm still doing something in the midst, and you can't see it, but just, just trust me. And, um, and I heard that so powerfully at every single Sunday, you know, giving. Just this is our, our little seed, Lord, but, you know, I know you can multiply it, and even if we feel we don't have, we know you'll somehow provide a way. You'll make a way for us. And, um, and sev- a couple weeks back, I had prayed for a job because I really needed to, yeah, just to help provide, right? But even as I s- submitted that long 19-page you know, application and put my heart into that, and even as I prayed for that, under my breath, I didn't share with my husband initially because I want to be honoring to him and as his helper, I said, Lord, this isn't really the answer to prayer because you know I'm already stretching, it would only stretch me out even more. And what we need is our house to be sold. And, and what that kind of reminded me of is when we come to God and we ask for little things and he says, don't you know I can move even greater than that? I can move beyond, like bigger than that? And, um, and two days later, we get a call, we have an offer on your home. And I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, can I tell him now? I was like, <laughs> I was still being obedient. I still did what I, you know. But um, he just kept pressing that upon my heart, trust. And then, you know, tithing, I've always seen it as an opportunity. That's something that I, in that area, I'm always like, it's okay, it's like negative, but that's okay, just give. And Eric's like, what are you talking about? That's crazy, but... For me, it's an opportunity, and because God keeps showing up. And so now to get to this place of, you know, moving in escrow and the way it was happening, initially they said they were going to close in 45 days. They moved us all the way back to 30. The end of our lease is up this month, and they're closing on the 23rd of this month. So that gives us seven days. And in other words, all that, it 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 inquires, it it means more money, more money, but now as God has been moving and working the details out that have, that's looked very scary, it's, it's coming out even more better than we could have expected. And we're just like, oh my gosh, God. So, and then it's on our heart. As you know, um, the Hispanic family, we love staying together. We, you know, we very much flock together. And so that was really heavy on our heart. We we're sharing last week, there's nothing on the market. And then there ends up being a home for sale here in this subdivision. And so we're only like three blocks down, so we're in the Red Feather subdivision. <laughs> so God, he's, he's really moving stuff like far beyond that we could see, but the, the details are just like, he's like, I got you, I got you, I got you. And so I encourage you if you're in that, and, and mind you, it's, it's been a year, if you're in that season of testing and... Um, I think I shared something yesterday and just that I got a, a good word from Stephen that had that little message, but um, yeah, I can to, to walk in faith, focus, focus, um, and God, he orchestrates his promises. You know, he's, he's working it all out. And so um, yeah, I just want to encourage you with that if you're in that season of testing. And see what God will do with that little seed, those little coins that the woman left. But, oh, my gosh, she, she left it all. She gave it all. She laid it all down. So, yeah, so thank you. So I just want to pray for our tithes and offerings, pray for everyone here. Father God, I just thank you that you're so faithful. You are so, so good. I thank you that your promises never return void and that you're orchestrating all the details out for our good, Lord. I bless every single one of our family members here. I bless their finances. I bless their home, Lord. I pray that, I pray for provision that you will continue to provide abundantly, exceedingly. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Lena. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Happy for you guys. Happy for you guys.
Luke 24. Luke 24. We have a very clear agenda at this church. We have a plan, a purpose, and an agenda. And that agenda is to camp in the presence of God. Just like the Israelites did in the Old Testament. It was not a sermon. It was His presence that they were moved by. And the pillar of fire and the cloud of smoke. And today, you know, just in case anybody's wondering, in the times of waiting or stillness or... I'm pacing back and forth, or Laura's quiet, or, you know, it's something that we practice in our lives. We practice getting out of the way, getting out of our own understanding, and letting the Lord come and move how He wants. And the more we do that, He moves. It's amazing when the church just lays down its agenda, lays down its personalities, and says, Lord, this is your place. We are your sheep, the, shep uh, the sheep of your flock, the flock of your pasture. Um, come and have your way. The Lord will move. And it's amazing. You see signs. You see wonders. You see miracles. You see transformation. You see amazing things when you just let the Lord come and do what He wants to do. He is he's the one that's in charge. He's our focus. And that's our goal. That's our agenda here in this place. And sometimes we've had a Sunday where there was no sermon. You know? But the Lord showed up and ministered to His people and did stuff. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So history has been shaped. I am making this claim. You don't have to believe me, but I hope you do. History has been shaped by the encounters that we read about in the Bible. History would not be the same if Moses never had the burning bush on his path. Okay? Moses was going throughout his life, and there was a bush burning. He could have walked right past it in disbelief, or it was an oddity, or something that was peculiar, or maybe uh, someone lit a firework, or there was a forest fire, or lightning struck that bush, and passed right by it. But Moses turned aside. There was a response. There was an action on Moses' part towards the burning bush. And that reaction, the burning bush, the presence of the Lord in the bush, and Moses' response became an encounter that altered history. And the Bible is made up of, of encounters, 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 real people experiencing a real God. It's that simple. I love when I'm in public and I get to tell people, hey, do you know about Jesus? Sure, yeah. You know, I've heard, of course, people have heard about Jesus. And I'm like, no, do you know, like, he's alive today? He's here in Meridian, Idaho. He's here. You can wake up with him in the morning. You can go to bed with him at night. Like, he's real. He's really real. And I tell him, he's more real than me in front of you right now. But you got to open up by faith and believe it. And for me, when I became a Christian, my Christian conversion or my conversion to discipleship or following Jesus was an encounter. It was an experiential encounter, not necessarily an intellectual one. Although I was in a four-hour dialogue and debate with a lawyer who was trying to win me to Christ. There was some intellect involved. But as soon as I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I received inside of my body the presence of the Holy Spirit. I shook, I trembled, I wept, and I fell into the couch, and I cried like a baby. And it's like immediately my eyes were open. It was an experience that was beyond my imagination. It was beyond my intellect. It was beyond my ability to reason. That's why being born again is so fascinating because you cannot be born again until you put your mind aside, you put your intellect aside. That's why intellectual people, I try my hardest when they want to reason with me and argue with me and debate. I, I challenge them. I know you're a smart person. I know you know about this subject or yes, that's a great question. But how brave are you and how willing are you to take a risk right now and to become like a little child and lay down all your intellect and by faith, Give my God a try. Are you willing to take that risk? Because if you're not, all you'll be is intellectual and smart, and you'll never experience the goodness of God. And so I don't debate too much anymore. I used to love it. I used to love debating. I loved Ravi Zacharias. I got to go to uh, some of his things. I got to meet him and get a hug by him and prayed for by him and loved Ravi Zacharias. I would walk the streets at night and listen to this guy's sermon and memorize 
arguments and apologetics and doctrine and theology. And I had this agenda and this goal throughout Bible college and seminary to win people to Christ through this means of debate and apologetics. And I was intense about it. I would look for opportunities to debate with atheists and agnostics because I knew I had the right answers. When you have the right answers, it's exciting carrying around the goods. You know what I mean? You have what people need. And then I get into seminary, and then we did it amongst ourselves in the classrooms, Christian against Christian, debating, well, the gifts of the Spirit, are they still in existence, or are they not? Did they cease? And, and, and all these theologies. And, man, I got immersed for three years in this, this um, system of thought and intellect and reasoning and arguing and all this stuff. And I remember at the end of my senior year of seminary, I started having these encounters with God, with his power, with his, um, his character, his personality. And more and more of my Christian experience became a desire to enjoy him, to love him, and to help others enjoy him and love him. And I started debating with people less and less. One of the things I did as a brand new believer is I would go next door to Rexburg where I lived and I would knock on doors of the campuses of all the students that went to BYU and the apartments and I would debate with them and try to win them to Christ. For a whole summer, I converted nobody. Nobody. My arguments were so good, guys. So good. So good. So good. And I was right. I was right, and I won nobody. I won nobody. And so I've experienced a lot. How to win people, how to bring people to Christ. How to now reconcile people to Christ. Is it through intellect? Sometimes. Sometimes. Paul reasoned with people. And sometimes it's through love. Sometimes it's through a sign or a wonder, you know? In the, in the New Testament, you'll read of the apostles Preaching, and then God accompanied the preaching of the word with signs and wonders, and people were converted through miracles. But now, I don't do the intellectual thing anymore. I challenge people to take a risk and be foolish. And I say, man, you want to stay in your intellect? You want to stay in that agnosticism or that atheism? You're scared, man. You're scared. Because you know what I have might be true, and if it is, it's going to require something of you. And so you're scared. You hide behind your intellect. Go ahead. Stay there. A few weeks ago when I was out in the wilderness and there was a guy that came and camped next to me. This is where he was at. He had all types of questions about the Germans and the Jews and Hitler and why do good things happen and how can a God allow these things and why can't I just have my own relationship with him? And he didn't want, you know, he didn't want to succumb to the exclusivity of Christ being the only way, the truth, and the life. And he wanted to argue with me about all this stuff. How can God be loving and there really be hell and you know, and I, and I said, well, I have answers to all your questions. I do. I have answers to all your questions. But do you want the answers before I even get into this with you? Or do you just want to talk and drink your bourbon and sit by your campfire and just philosophize? Because what do you want to do? What's your purpose? Do you just want someone to talk to? Because if you want someone to talk to, I'm not your guy. I don't do that with people. I have a very limited time on this earth. People need to know Jesus, and I don't want to waste time. But if you want the answers, I can help you find those answers. So I challenge this guy, come, come out of your intellect, come down into your heart. He opened up to me, explained all this pain, all this stuff he's gone through, lost a son to suicide, and in the middle of a divorce, and all this hurt. And I said, man, there's healing for you. There's healing for you. There's restoration for you. My, my wife has been through hurtful stuff. My wife was in a terrible relationship before we got married. Stuff that you go through that you don't think you're going to heal from, and yet you come to meet Christ and you realize you can heal from anything. God can work out anything for the good of those who love Him. It's crazy. It's awesome. I had stuff in my life I didn't think I'd ever recover from and that I was disqualified from holding this microphone and preaching and teaching and shepherding. And God was like, man, the gifts and calling I have on your life are irrevocable. I'm going to use all things for the good. Just stay in love with me. Stay in love with me. So I get this guy to come down into his heart and take a risk as a child and give his life to Jesus by faith in his heart, and then he confesses with his mouth. But I had an experience of conversion that was deeper than intellect, and then the intellect followed. Sometimes in our Christian experience, we encounter, 
and then the explanation follows. We don't always understand what's going on in the moment. Moses didn't know what was happening in the burning of the bush. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, until later. And then he's up on Mount Sinai, and God is revealing the, the Torah, the law to him, um, his guidance, his will, his principles, and Moses gets understanding later. Um, but I was out in the mountains the other day, and I was reading through Scripture, and I haven't been in Luke for a while, but I, I opened up to Luke 24, and I want to talk about some things I saw in Luke 24 about the importance of encounter and not to diminish the opportunity to encounter the Lord. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. You can experience the living God. It's not all intellect all the time. Intellect is good. We're supposed to be students of the Word of God. We're supposed to know the Word of God in season and out of season. We're supposed to study this thing to show ourselves approved. Okay? But none of that can happen if there's not encounter. Encounter gives way to intimacy, and then intimacy gives way to knowledge and understanding. And then you can carry wisdom as a lover of God. Because when you have Christians carrying the wisdom of God and they're not lovers of God, you know what happens. You know what happens out there. There's church junk all over the place, and the church messes up the world instead of helps the world. And it's like all they need to do is have a prayer meeting once a week and start praying again. Stop preparing your sermon and get in your prayer closet again and love on the Lord. And stop trying to give stuff away that wasn't given to you. And generating a message that the Lord didn't speak to you. You can't give anything authentically that the Lord didn't give to you authentically. And you can't receive from the Lord unless you make time for Him. You can't. You can't. My agenda every week is not to have something to give you guys, although I love sermons, I love preaching, I love the Word of God, and it's fun. It's fun. But my goal every week is to be with Jesus and make sure I'm letting Him love me. And out of that place, I will hopefully have something to say to you guys, whether in action or in word. You know? So Luke 24, I do want to read this whole chapter. Okay? And God hates grumblers and complainers. He just, there's things that God hates. So if you don't want to stand for the reading of this scripture... He's going to get you. <laughs> He's going to get you. The Word of God is special, guys. The Word of God is special. I'm not going to read it as slow as I want because of some things we've taken time for today, testimonies and prayer. Um, so I'm going to read it at a pretty good pace out of the ESV, okay? But on the first day, and just pay, pay attention, follow this. There's some really unique things to catch here. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, and just take note right here, okay, they were perplexed. They didn't have the intellect, they didn't have the understanding, and in the midst of their perplexion, they receive an encounter. They receive a revelation. So it's not always about having all the answers. And as they stood by them, and uh, excuse me, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Verse 6 He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. Verse 8 And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things the apostles, uh, to the apostles. I love how women played such a role in transforming society and culture and releasing the gospel. It was often the women that encountered this stuff and did it first. I don't know where the men were. Where are the men of God today? Each one of you better raise your hand right now. You're right here. You're right here. Women are awesome because if the man's not getting it done, they'll step up and they'll get it done. And they carried the message. Verse 11, But these words seemed to them like an idle tale. Remember this. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves and went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. 
but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I'm telling you this right now, guys. Jesus is closer to you than you're aware of many times throughout your day. He is very close to you. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, what things? I love how Jesus plays <laughs> games with us. He's a holy, righteous God, but he plays around sometimes. He, he, and if you know him, you know he does. He, and he plays hide and seek. He's the one that game originated from. He likes to hide and he likes to have you pursue him. And he does the same to you when you hide. Wow, good. What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and the word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they, had not, when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was still alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see, and he said to them, O foolish ones, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now notice the intellectual side of this. Jesus gave them a revelatory theological discourse of understanding. But they did not yet receive an encounter of him. Okay? So this plays a part, but it's not the end all. It's not the means by which you can see him and have your eyes opened. Still, it didn't happen. Verse 28, they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. This is what's funny about Jesus again. He knows they want him with him, but he kind of does this. Okay, you're going to invite me back? I'll be with you, you know. <laughs> But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. What's up with that, Lord? As soon as I see you, you're gone. Wow. That, that just blows my mind. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Guys, God is a consuming fire. You ought to be feeling fire in your hearts if you're spending time with him. Paul says, Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Is your heart burning? Are you loving him? Is he your first love? Ask yourself these questions. It's better that you do it than on that day. And he says, man, you could have had more. You could have experienced more. You could have had more fire. You could have done more. You could have saved more. Ask yourself, is your heart burning today? If it is, you're, you're in communion with him. Because he himself is a consuming fire. Verse 33, And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Once again, not known to them on the road, but in the breaking of bread. Not known to them in a moment of movement, but mo known to them in a moment of being still. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. Now, notice, back in the beginning of this chapter, the apostles wrote it off as an uh, idle tale. And then Jesus walks through the door. He appears to them. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, wow. get this, they still disbelieved, face to face with the Lord. This is almost like Moses receiving the Ten Commandments 
and disagreeing with them in the midst of the revelation. Watch how merciful God is, guys. Showed them his hands and feet, and while they still disbelieved for joy, were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I speak spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Last verse. We're not going to go any further than this to the ascension. We're going to close with verse 49. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Very interesting. Before you sit down real quick, he promises them momentum. The Holy Spirit's coming. And because of that momentum, you're supposed to hold still. When God is moving, you've got to hold still and let him move to get what he wants to do in your life. Now, Lord, we bless this word. I bless your people, and may your face shine upon us today through revelation and encounter through this word. In Jesus' name, I receive it. Amen. You guys all right? You guys all right? Oh, boy. No. <laughs> Never all right. That's why I'm qualified. If I was in my right mind, you wouldn't want me to lead. I would do everything according to my own understanding and not by faith. I just want to talk to you about a couple things. First, first thing, knowing is not enough. Knowing is not enough. The Jews knew all about God, yet failed to recognize Him when He came face to face. The Jews had everything. They had it all. They had the fullest revelation and expression of God in history out of every tribe and tongue. And they were the ones that couldn't recognize Him. Knowing is not enough. How many people today know about Jesus? They're familiar with the story, but don't actually walk with Him. Don't be deceived when you go out and tell people about Jesus if they say they already know Him. Don't stop there. Let the Holy Spirit use you to minister to that person's heart and try to get them to a level of experience, of encounter. It's interesting, in Luke 24, check this out. The rumors, the empty tomb, Jesus' linen clothes, the women's testimonies were not enough to convince the apostles. All that stuff was true. All that stuff was powerful. All that stuff was miracles. Verse 11, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. That's crazy. All the stuff was there to believe, in my opinion, that was enough. That was enough. And then they still didn't believe. It was an idle tale. The Greek word, leros, is this word. It occurs only once in all of Scripture. It's a very rare word, this, this word for idle tale. It occurs one time in Scripture, and I hope in your life it's extremely rare as well. It means literally a story too incredible to believe. This, this is kind of the double-edged sword about the gospel. The gospel's dangerous in that it is so true and it's so good. On one side, it's so good, it's so true, and people stumble over that when they hear about the love of God. Oh, man, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad of a sinner I am. And yet, dude, God loves you. God can forgive you. God can heal you. And they say, that's, that's too good. That's too easy. All I have to do is trust Jesus. All I have to do is surrender my will. Really? Come on. There's, no, there's got to be strings attached. There's got to be more than this. I probably have to join a certain church and do all these things throughout the week and fast and pray and read the Bible. and you know, Eventually, you get there. But you get there through love, not works, not legalism. But they hear the gospel and they say, man, this story is too incredible to believe. There's no way. And it becomes a stumbling block. That's what happened here. The women came to the apostles and said, man, we just saw all these signs that that's too good to be true. That's no way. We don't believe you. And they disbelieved their story. You know, it's like, how could God really love me this much? And the answer is, you know, the story is too good, but it is true. It really is true. It really is. The, the story is almost too good to believe. It really is. Have you guys felt that? When you've received a genuine, simple revelation of the gospel, and you're thinking, this is too good. Like, really? Is it really? And the Holy Spirit's like, yep. It's this simple. It's all about Jesus. Don't make it complicated. The whole Bible and all of its theology points to Jesus. 
It's very simple. So first of all, knowing is not enough. Secondly, the power of marveling comes out in this story. The power of marveling. The power of awe. The power of wonder. We're going to see this contrast. Evidence about Jesus is good. Rumors about Jesus are good. But in order for it to become personal, there has to be encounter. The message comes to the apostles. The apostles don't believe it. And then we come to Peter in verse 12. Check out verse 12. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. It's interesting because Peter's foolishness got him in trouble, and now his foolishness gets him the answers and gets him the encounter because he, has, he was the only one willing to respond. So doesn't it surprise you that none of the other apostles did what Peter did? A little bit, a little surprising with the evidence they had. Here's the difference with Peter. There's seven verbs that describe his response. Seven verbs describe Peter's reaction. He heard the word. He rose up. He ran. He stooped down. He looked in. He saw and he marveled. Okay, if you read that in verse 12, there's seven verbs that describe Peter's action. Okay, some of the apostles hear the story. Foolishness, no way. What is that? That's pride. That's arrogance. Peter, on the other hand, responds with seven verbs. He listens, he hears, he runs, he, he stoops, he gets low. He actually looks into the tomb. Humble yourself. You want to encounter the Lord? Don't just hear the word. Humble yourself under the word. And look into it. Investigate for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't be shepherded or pastored by me. Let the Holy Spirit shepherd you. You shall have no teacher in your life other than the Holy Spirit. Nobody has an excuse not to know the will of God for their life and to walk in his revelation. It's like, here's the gospel, here's the revelation of Jesus, here's the glory of the Father, here's the power of the Holy Spirit, and as great as it all is, it's merely a word, if not accompanied by the right response. This is what makes marveling possible. There's a response involved. And so Peter, he marveled, and he became stunned with admiration and wonder. If you want to encounter the Lord more, and this is my goal in this whole thing today, guys, is to encourage you to live a life of encounter with God. And don't believe for one moment that you can't cultivate a real tangible experience with this God of yours. Get to the place of awe and wonder and admiration. Why is it that the gospel can be preached all over the world and yet so many reject it? Here's what I heard this week in, in, with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, why can so many people reject the gospel and what I heard the Holy Spirit say is because there's no admiration and there's no wonder. Kids are addicted to stupid stuff that's captivating their imaginations on the screen. Parents, be very careful how much time you give your kids on electronics and what age you give them a phone. Be very careful you shepherd their awe, their admiration, and their wonder for the Lord. If you give them too much access to the world and they don't have to work for that access, they will lose their admiration and wonder for God. I have to tell this to you. Don't let it creep into your life. It's never too late. If it's already happening, withdraw. Take it back a little. Talk with your kids. Recapture that wonder. We saw it happening with our kids. We gave them electronic time and let them watch shows and stuff like that. And we started noticing in our times of prayer and worship, they were all over the place and they weren't captivated anymore. And Laura and I, we just heard this, all, this warning. God saying, get them now. Shape them now. Shepherd them now. And don't feel bad that they're not like the rest of the kids at their school. Yeah. Judah, Dad, all my friends have a phone. When can I have a phone? I said, Judah, do you want the answer? Because that's going to require a long conversation. It's not that simple. <laughs> More than I want you to have a phone, I want you to fulfill the purpose of God on your life. And it's not going to look like it does for your friends. And he goes to a Christian school with Christian parents. And it's in the church, guys. Be very careful. Honor the Holy Spirit. Tell your kids it's okay not to be like the rest of the world. Let them know it's okay to be confident knowing they might not have the same access to things that their friends have access to because they're precious in God's sight. They're valuable. They have a destiny and a calling. And I explain these things to Judah. I explain them to Iris. And we talk to them about stewardship in the right time. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, says the God of this world has blinded 
the eyes of unbelievers so that they can't see. What has he blinded them with? Well, all kinds of distractions, and electronics is a huge one. We can't ignore that. We can't ignore that one. If you don't respect the message, you won't experience it. If there's no honor and admiration for the gospel, you will not experience it. That's why we're told to fear God. When you fear God, you experience Him because you are in your right place, humbled before a holy God, and He's in His right place as Lord of your life, and you experience the good life. I'm telling you, it's through fear of God. It's through admiration. It's through wonder. Secondly, if you don't receive the message like a child, you won't be changed by it. If you don't honor the message, you won't be changed by it. If you don't receive it like a child, you won't be changed by it. So in one instance, we have our children getting captivated by other things. Maybe not the Lord. And us parents, we're wrestling with it. I know you guys are feeling some of this too. Laura and I do. We live in the same world you guys live in. And you can't receive the message unless you receive it by a, uh, as a child and you can't be changed by it. Matthew 19, 14. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Children by nature at the beginning possess wonder, and because of that they get possessed by the Holy Spirit. If you guys want to see some cool stuff, go on YouTube and type in Andreas Bassani. Holy Spirit TV. Look it up on YouTube and watch his videos he has made his life's ambition to go throughout the nations of the earth and see the youth and the generations of children get filled with the Spirit of God. And guys, watch the footage on these videos. Watch what happens. It's possible. Thousands and thousands of kids come to the altar weeping for Jesus, repenting of their sins, getting filled and baptized by the Holy Spirit. It's possible. We might not see it in America because America is being blinded in some ways by the enemy and children are under attack and it's our job as parents to help them be recaptivated by Jesus. Guys, do you want to stand before Jesus on that day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant? You know, the only thing I want more than that is to pass through that line and then wait for Judah and Iris to come on by and they receive the same accolade from the Lord. It's up to you. Get them there. Help your kids. Help your kids to stand apart. Help your kids to repossess their wonder, their imagination, their awe, their marveling. And once again, we're talking about what happened with Peter. Peter became like a kid, and he went in and he investigated the gospel. He pursued it, and he, re he received a revelation of it. Peter, in his adulthood, was able to humble himself like a kid, get low, get out of his head, and therefore begin to receive an encounter that the other apostles didn't. And adults, don't ever lose your posture as a child. Just don't do it. Don't grow up. Get in your prayer closet and be a kid. Be a kid again. Expect great things from Him. Cry out to Him. Depend on Him. Delight in Him. Enjoy Him. He's your Father. First, knowing is not enough. Second, the power of marveling. Thirdly, the breaking of bread. This is probably my favorite. The breaking of bread. We, you guys, we just got done with six sermons on Psalm 23. And how the Lord prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And why the table is significant. Why in the presence of your enemies He's not preparing a bed for you to sleep in. Because He wants you awake, feasting in your battles, not sleeping through them. And there's something very significant that takes place in that table. In the Lord preparing food for you. Now Revelation defines encounter. And encounter comes by the breaking of bread. And we saw this. If you want to write this down, verses 12 through 32. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Interesting. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Let me just say this. What you believe will determine what you see. Okay? While he was walking on the road with them, those people were believing a past word, a past testimony. And Jesus was right there with them in the present moment. Sometimes if you're not seeing the Lord, it's because you're still in the past on a previous word and He's encountering you with a new word, a new revelation. And you, you, can, believe, you can believe a good thing. Notice how they believed all the right things. He's going to be crucified and resurrected and, all, and it's the third day and they believed all the right things, but still they weren't encountering Him. You can have all the right things, all the access to it and believe the right things, but still not see. 
What you believe determines what you see. And then verses 30 through 31. When he sat at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, and immediately their eyes were open. And he vanished from their sight. I could say so much about this scripture. This is powerful. On their walk with the Lord while receiving a theological discourse, even then their hearts burned within them, but they still couldn't see until the moment of the breaking of bread. It's crazy how many attempts and efforts God made to give the opportunity of encounter to mankind. And yet finally it came to the point where the body of Jesus had to be broken to unlock the thing, to tear the veil, to give full revelation. It took the breaking of his body. I will suggest to you the same thing I suggested in Psalm 23. The table makes all the difference in your encounter. If you in your house do not have a table symbolically where you are meeting with the Lord, you probably aren't encountering him on the level that he wants to encounter you with. You need a secure, established time of meeting with God and a place where you do it. The breaking of bread was a moment of exchange, a moment of surrender. And until they were willing to stop and receive what he was offering, they couldn't see him. Think about that. Until they were willing to receive what he was offering, they couldn't see him. Notice how the Lord used a meal to reveal his death in Luke 22 in communion. He used a meal to reveal his death, and now he uses a meal again to reveal his life and his glory. I want to encounter the Lord. I do. I know you guys do. May we come with an open heart and be willing to receive and partake of what he's offering us, whatever it looks like, whether it feels good or not, whether it's uncomfortable. If it's from the Lord, receive it. Take it. Take it. Ask the Lord. Listen, He broke the bread, He blessed it, and He gave it to them. They didn't have to receive it. He broke it, He blessed it, He gave it to them. Ask the Lord in your quiet time, what are you breaking? What are you breaking? What are you blessing? And what are you giving me to receive? What are you breaking? What are you blessing? What are you giving me to receive? See, the bread represents friendship and communion. The breaking of bread is where revelation happens. Number four, how can he, how can he be in the room and go unnoticed? How is that possible? How is it possible for the King of kings, the Lord of glory, the creator of heaven and earth to be in the room and go unnoticed? Listen to this. Because until you're willing to partake of what he's broken, you will not recognize him. That statement, I can't even put into words what I felt in that statement. It's, it was complicated. It was a revelatory statement for me. And I don't even think I'm doing a good job explaining it here. But that one statement, until you're willing to partake in what he's broken, you will not recognize him. And you can be in a room where he's moving and not experience him. He's broken the power of the enemy. He's broken hell of its power. He's broken the curse of sin. He's broken bitterness. He's broken unforgiveness, depression, addiction, pride. He's broken all these things. And until you're ready to receive that and believe it, you won't experience him. You have to believe what the Lord has broken over your life in order to experience him. All you have to do is this. I'm ready to eat the bread, Lord. I'm ready to eat the bread. The Lord has broken stuff on your life. He's broken His own life in order to free you from everything that ensnares you and entangles you. And all you have to do is say, I'm ready to sit at this table and eat the bread of forgiveness, the bread of mercy, the bread of grace, the bread of empowerment by the Holy Spirit, the bread of walking in victory over all sin and all addiction. All of it. All of it. Don't come to me and tell me that you cannot truly be fully free in this life if you're a Christian. If you believe that, you are limiting the power of the blood of Jesus and His death and resurrection. He came to set you free fully. 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 Completely. Completely. I'm ready to eat the bread, Lord. And then your eyes will be opened and you'll notice Him in an instant. And that also has something to say about what is He breaking in you. Lord, what do you want to break off of me? What do you want to break in my life? Break it. Break it.
I can promise you this. He's got broken bread on the table. He's here. It's available. And I challenge you to ask yourself, am I experiencing as much of the Lord as I desire to? As much as he's making available. And if you're not, I encourage you on Sundays, come here and let it go. Let it go. Worship him. Come here and confess your sin. Let him heal you. Confess your self-dependency and let him reestablish you. Let all your walls of resistance crumble and receive his grace and mercy and then you'll encounter him. I get jealous sometimes when I go to Christian conferences and I'm worshiping and then I see this woman or this man completely getting touched by the Holy Spirit, wrecked, wrecked by the Holy Spirit. Ah, 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 ah. And they're down on the ground getting encountered. And I get jealous and I'm, I'm like, me too, Lord. Me, don't you forget about me. Don't. Me with me. Break my hip if you have to. Wrestle me. No, this is not fair. Get jealous. Get jealous. And then you realize what happened before that encounter. That person brought a broken and contrite heart. And the Lord looks to and fro throughout the earth for those whose hearts are bent towards him in brokenness and humility. And then I realized that. I said, okay, what in me is still pride? What am I not broken of? How am I not humbling myself? And then you start examining yourself. You start doing that business with God. with God, Because he's, he's making an attempt to encounter everybody like that. And you can say, well, I'm not really that kind of a person and blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling you that God is no respecter of persons. God will wreck you with his love. God will wreck you with his power. But guys, when we come here on Sundays, and I feel it happening, we are losing our sense of holding on to whatever we think worship is supposed to be. And we're letting go more in our corporate gatherings. We're letting go more. And the more we do that, guys, the more we just forget about the person next to us and worship and give him our broken heart and get real with him, guys, we're going to be a church of encounter. We are. We're going to be a church of encounter. Real quickly, as we close, the fourth thing. I think, is this the fourth thing? Fifth? The fifth thing, despite disbelief, he still pursues. I love that. Verse 36 is a reference for this, that they, all the disbelief, he still walked through the wall. He said, here's my hands. Like, here I am. No, what? No way. No, no. Yeah. It's me. Jesus, Jesus shifted things. God hated unbelief in the Old Testament. The Father hated it. The Father punished the Israelites because of unbelief. And then Jesus comes in the midst of unbelief and keeps pursuing. Jesus is not contrary to the Father, but he does reveal another side of the Father. And in Jesus... He loves us despite our failures, our doubts, our inconsistencies, and the Lord is still eager to encounter us. There's nothing you guys can do this week that's going to hinder His pursuit of you. you. Might as well just get over yourself and surrender. You can go do all you want to try to forget about the Lord this week and do what you want to do and enjoy what you want to enjoy and just, just I got to, you know, just get this out of my system or whatever. Whatever. There's one thing you're not going to overcome and be able to fight against, and it's His pursuit of you. You can't do it. He's going to walk deeper into your disbelief and deeper into your sin than you're going to be able to get away from. You can't run from him. He's constantly pursuing you with a desire to make himself known. And his agenda is to be completely known by all of us. I have this written down. And for the reality of his presence to crush all other inferior experiences. There's a lot of good things to experience out there in this world, but I pray the reality of His presence would crush those inferior experiences, that He would be the true love, the true love of your life, the true love. Coming down to the closing here. You guys all right? The Bible's not enough. The Bible's not enough. Hear me on this. Some of you right now are thinking, what? The Bible's not enough? Listen. The Bible is infallible. The Bible is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and everything in it is profitable. But the Bible, while it contains the greatest story ever told, will only remain a story if it's not accompanied by the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
This man I talked to out in the, uh, the campground that day had read the Bible a few times. Still wasn't born again. How is that possible? And I told him, I said, that's the only book on earth you cannot read without the presence of the one who wrote it. You will not get it. You will not get it. You read the book of Revelation as a non-believer, you won't get it. You read the book of Revelation as a Holy Spirit, you'll get it. You'll understand it. There's nothing in Scripture that you won't be able to understand without the presence of the author. If he wants to make something known to you, he will. This is what I mean by the Bible is not enough. And it's very sig significant that at the end of these encounters, Jesus, in verse 49, that's why we ended on verse 49, this is what happened. He commanded them to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father came upon them and they were clothed with power from on high. So check this out. They had all the revelation. They had Jesus in front of him and Jesus says, stay. Do not go make disciples until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible apart from the Holy Spirit is not enough. There's Bibles all over the country. There's Bibles in hotel rooms and it doesn't mean people are getting saved. We need the Spirit of God. Jesus knew the message was not enough, and in order for the message to be sustained through their lives for the long haul, they needed continual encounter and power of the Holy Spirit and His constant presence accompanying them. This is why Christians can be persecuted and put in prison and their Bible taken away from them, and they're still filled with the fullness of God and living their faith, and they're not, they don't even have the Scriptures. They have the presence of the one who wrote the Scriptures. This is why you can lose your Bible, and you can still do what you need to do without your Bible. And this is also why we don't worship the Bible. We worship the Spirit. We worship the author, the creator, the originator of the Bible. And as we worship Him, we believe and we uphold the Word of God. It's perfect. It's perfect. But Jesus, in His message, tells Him to wait. And the Word of God points to the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. A few verses. Just let me prove this to you. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 Because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Not just in word. What brought about full conviction? It was the Holy Spirit. Acts 14.3 So they remained for a long time, speaking of the disciples or apostles, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The apostles are in the temple sharing the word of God, and the Lord accompanies them with the miracles of His Spirit. It's like, how come, what, Lord, was the Word not enough? And they go hand in hand, they're partners, the Word and the Spirit. John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So the words Jesus speaks are spirit and life. And the Word, accompanied by the Spirit, produces life. The Word by itself does not produce life. The Word, apart from the Spirit, actually produces religion and legalism and perversion. You know who knows the Word? Satan himself knows the Word. But he's devoid of the Spirit of God. So what does he do? He makes converts and disciples of the Word only. Because as soon as you get the Word and you get the Spirit and you get born again, you'll become a disciple of Jesus. This is what I mean by the Bible is not enough. It has to be accompanied by the Spirit and then it produces life. So here's my conclusion. Here's what I want to encourage you with. Five sentences. The first sentence is this. Don't value the Word only. Value the Spirit also in your personal walk with God. Sometimes when you get into your prayer closet, you don't have to open up the Bible right away and do a devotional and then go on with your day. Sit there and talk to Him like He's a friend. Worship Him. Put on a worship song. Sing to Him. Sit with Him. Lord, I love you. What do you want to do right now? Maybe He wants to teach you the Word. Maybe He doesn't. Maybe He wants you to be still. Don't value the Word only, value the Spirit also. Number two, don't stop at simply hearing the Word. Respond to the Word by faith. This is what Peter did, and he was rewarded with an encounter. Don't stop at simply hearing the Word, but respond to the Word by faith. Number three, increase your anticipation of an ongoing encounter with the Lord. Increase your anticipation for an ongoing encounter with the Lord. And make yourself available for that encounter. Number four, Surrender yourself to the fact that God is pursuing you the rest of your life. I said this earlier. Just surrender. Just surrender to it. Surrender yourself to the fact that God is pursuing you the rest of your life. And number five is my favorite. Be as eager to know Him as He is to know you. Be as eager to know Him 
as he is to know you. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, when you begin to thirst for the Lord like the deer pants for streams of living water, it will take your Christian experience up to another level. It will. It's one thing, it's one of the most important things you can pray for is the gift of spiritual hunger. Ask God to give you a cry for him that's as intense as his cry for you. And then relationship will get ignited on a whole nother level. And you'll be a Christian who doesn't just talk about Jesus. You actually walk with him. You actually carry him. You actually bear fruit. You don't have to force fruit. It just happens from your life. Let's stand and pray together. Good stuff, huh? I figure if I'm encouraged by it, hopefully you are. I preach to myself first, trust me. Trust me. And I'm way harder on myself than I am on anybody else. Thank you, Lord. We surrender to your relentless pursuit of us. We surrender. I pray as we go into the end of summer and fall that the encounters that we have as a church, corporately and privately, will be mind-blowing. And there won't be enough time to share all of our testimonies when we get together. That's what I pray for this season. As we move into fall, I pray the encounters for this church and for every believer here in this family will be mind-blowing. And that the encounters will result in a greater love for Jesus, a greater devotion to Him and His Word, and a transformed life that lives to please Him and walks in holiness and boldness without fear of sharing the gospel in the world that we live in and standing up for truth. I bless you guys today. Like we sung, may His face shine upon you. May His favor go with you and saturate your life in your children and their children. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you guys. Yeah.